Thank you and good afternoon everyone. Yes, I come from the JRC and I will give actually a presentation on the uh, Inspire Reference Validator. You see a long list of names here. Actually, this includes colleagues at the JRC, but also the people who are currently leading the development of the, of the validator. So I'll start with some just brief introduction on Inspire to set a bit of context for all of you so you know that Inspire is a directive uh, providing a legal, a technical and an organizational framework for creating a European Union as spatial data infrastructure to support environmental policies. This by um, ensuring interoperability in terms of a lot of components, but mainly data, metadata, and services. And this infrastructure should not be created from scratch, but as we have already heard in the previous presentations, should be created by making interoperable the SDIs that already exist and are operated by the member states. Um, uh, practically speaking, the directive is complemented by implementing rules and technical guidance. This concept will be quite important in the following. So what's the difference? Uh, implementing rules are legally binding documents and they tell what the member states must do to implement the directive. So basically in terms of the components, so uh, as I said, metadata, data sets in Inspire, the spatial scope is organized in 34 spatial data themes, as you know, so which cover basically environmental stuff. Um, uh, and then services. We have discovery services to discover the data through metadata. We have view services and download services to access and download the data. And then we have technical guidelines, uh, which are not legally binding, uh, but they explain from the practical and the technical point of view how the member states can uh, satisfy the legal requirements. And they make explicit reference to the OGC um, standards. Finally, we have uh, tools uh, to implement Inspire, and this is where the validator comes. So it's basically the focus of our talk. So first of all, why a common validator? Uh, many answers. First of all, as a tool to help member states uh, test their own resources, so metadata, data sets, and services against the requirements of Inspire. But the tool is also, uh, the validator is also a tool for us as coordinators of Inspire, but also for the coordinators uh, of member states to check the um, implementation progress of Inspire. And in this regard, I'll tell this also at the end, the validator, the plan is to use the validator for monitoring and reporting in the future. Uh, the validator is also a reference tool for the uh, software providers developing solutions for Inspire, so uh, GeoNetwork, GeoServer, and so on and so forth. Um, the development of the validator is currently funded by the ISA and ISA Square programs. It was started some years ago to actually align the, some efforts that were already ongoing at the JRC and also in some member states, of course, with the need to have consistent results, but also to exploit synergies and build upon uh, already existing uh, solutions. So the validator is not a single software, first of all, but it's based on a number of components. Um, the starting point is, again, the Inspire technical guidelines, which provide requirements for all uh, kind of resources, data, metadata, and services. From these uh, technical guidelines, first of all, abstract test suites, or ATS, are derived. ATS are high-level or abstract uh, descriptions of the tests. Then uh, ATS are uh, translated into ETS, or executable test suites, which are concrete uh, low-level descriptions that can be executed by a program. So it's basically the code. And finally, we have uh, the ETF, which, as I will uh, tell later, is a testing framework. It's the software that actually uh, allows to run uh, ETS. Uh, and all these components together make form what we call the Inspire Reference Validator. I will now dive a bit into each of these components to make things clear. So starting point is, again, the ATS, so the abstract test suites. They are organized in a number of conformance classes, and each of them in turn into test cases. Test cases basically cover test what is defined in each requirement of the um, technical guidance. Um, from abstract test suites, executable test suites are implemented, again, in a language that allows them to be executed. And uh, they are organized into um, a number of assertions for each test case. Very important to say is that uh, in Inspire, all the ATS and the ATS are agreed by the MIG, the Maintenance and Implementation Group, or the MIG-T. Uh, T stands for technical, in particular with a subgroup of people actually experts on, on validation. MIG is, has a very key role in uh, Inspire governance, actually. So uh, ATS are all uh, available uh, on GitHub, licensed under CC0. And basically, uh, well, you can find them under this workspace that is Inspire Validation and Conformity Testing. The rule here is that we have different repository, one for each uh, type of resource. So in terms of metadata, we have uh, ATS. 
for metadata TG 1.3 and the new one uh, for uh, TG Technical Guidance 2.0. We have, in terms of services, again, ATS for discovery services, view services, and download services. You can see that most of the content here is new. And then in terms of data sets, we have ATS for uh, data specifications covering the basic, the cross-cutting requirements, data encoding covering the requirements for GML encoding, and then we have one single repository for each spatial data theme of Annex 1. In Inspire, the spatial data themes are actually divided in Annex 1, 2, and 3, three uh, categories. Uh, practical example, just to make things uh, clear, at the left you have a piece of the technical guidance. This is about metadata, TG 2.0. Uh, what is important is that here we have a requirement uh, that says basically what the, this uh, spatial resolution element in this case of metadata should be. On the right you have the corresponding ATS on GitHub, so it's, as I said, a, low, a high level description of what the, how the test for this specific requirement should be. Um, then, uh, next step is the ETS. Um, ETS are again available on GitHub. This, this time the license is the UPL, the European Union Public License. In this case, they are all under the same repository, uh, and inside the repository you will have one different uh, folder for each type of resource. Again, most of the work has been done recently because we added ETS as well for uh, Metadata TG 2.0, Discovery Services, so CSW, uh, View Services, WMS, WMTS, and uh, within Discovery ser Download Services, uh, WCS and SOS are the uh, new ones. Uh, same example as before, so on the left, the ATS you have seen before. On the right, this is actually a part of the corresponding code to basically test uh, that specific requirement. So it's the translation of the ATS into something that can be executed. This is XQuery, uh, that it's a language to actually query uh, XML document. Final step is, as I said, the testing framework, which is a software where ETS can be run. Uh, in the case of Inspire, the validator makes use of the, an existing open source software, which is the ETF. Uh, it's a complete testing framework to validate resources in SDIs. Uh, development started in 2010 by Interactive Instruments, a German company. It's open source, uh, license is UPL. Uh, current stable version is 2.0, but uh, released in January. A new stable version is expected by the end of the year. Basically, the design of the ETF is driven by three goals. To be user-friendly, which means you don't need to be a developer to use it, but any user should be able to run tests and to understand the test results. To be consistent with the standards, ISO and OGC, and to be capable of testing metadata, data sets, and services. You have manuals for users, developers, and administrators. A deployment of the ETF consists of a database, of course, to store data such as the test results, uh, information about the test objects and the test runs, one or more test engines to basically execute the ETS, and a server container to run the web application. We have currently three um, test drivers for three test engines, so SOAP UI, uh, which is a widely used tool for testing web services, BaseX, which is an XML database to test uh, sets of XML documents, and Team Engine, which is the uh, testing tool used by the OGC site, which is the uh, compliance and interoperability testing um, evaluation. You can use ETF uh, through either an HTML web interface uh, or through a REST API. I will show you um, some examples later. And there's also a Docker container available to um, facilitate quick deployment, for example, on, on the cloud as we are using it. But I'll come to this um, in a minute. So. Technical context, uh, just to recap things, so basically uh, the Inspire test framework can be used by users through HTML web interface and uh, by software through the REST API. It has a database to store relevant information and it has test drivers to make use of test engines to basically make the test. Uh, here, uh, ETS are developed starting from the corresponding ATS, which are available on GitHub. Also ETS, as I said, are available on GitHub, and the repository, this is why it's a single repository, is read by the test uh, engine. And clearly, uh, developers can develop new ETS. This is typically happening in member states because they might need to have new ETS or to uh, extend the Inspire uh, ETS, for example, if they have national profiles of, of metadata. Web application is the first way to use the uh, Inspire validator. In particular, we have two instances, and we have worked a lot over the last year for, for this. A staging instance as a, and a production instance. The staging instance is meant for testing purposes and it always includes the latest developments in terms of 
bug fixes or uh, new functions. Production instance includes only the consolidated development, which means developments already tested and agreed upon by the community and, and the MIG team. Both these instances are deployed on the cloud because with the approaching of the inspired deadlines, but also with the planned role of the validator for monitoring and reporting, the tool is actually used by many uh, more uh, people. So that's basically a need to uh, improve performances, minimize downtime, down, downtime. So basically we decided to move it on the cloud. It's AWS. Just some screenshots to show you how the web application works. So suppose that we want to validate uh, metadata in this example, metadata 2.0 for data sets. So first thing is to select the conformance classes we are interested to test. Um, then once this is done, we have to provide the resource we want to test. For metadata and data sets, we can upload uh, a resource, a file, or a set of files, or even a zip file. Uh, or provide a link to the resource uh, for uh, services you have to um, enter the service endpoint. Then you start the test, so the ETS is executed and you have a test report in a human readable format. This is pure HTML. Uh, what's the content here? So here you have a summary of the test, uh, quite unreadable, but here you have a summary, so number of conformance classes you tested and corresponding number of test cases and assertions and then the number of tests that were skipped that failed, the warnings, and the number of manual tests. Manual tests is important because not everything can be checked automatically, so there is uh, usually an amount of tests that are left to the user, so are manual checks. And then here you have, in this case, we, check, we tested two conformance classes. You see we have these two colored according to the outcome of the test, so green means passed, red means failed, and yellow would mean manual checks. So if we click on one of them, suppose to click on the first one, then you have the full list of the test cases and the assertions. And you can understand basically what failed and why. This example here, there's the, you could see uh, almost unreadable that one out of three test cases failed. So this is the test case that failed. And here you can read that one out of five conform, uh, assertions failed. So this is the assertion that failed, and here, below here, you should read the error message and you would be able to actually fix your, your resource. Um, this is the idea. All the test reports are saved and they are available. They remain there for currently eight days. Uh, from these test reports page, user can filter the test reports using a uh, text uh, box here. They can download the reports uh, currently only as, as HTML. And there's also a very useful button introduced recently to run the test again. Run the test again without having again to uh, choose the conformance classes. So the idea is that you run a test, you get some errors, you fix your resource, and then you run the test again. As I said, there's also a REST API uh, published using OpenAPI. This is also very used by the member states to schedule, to manage, to start tests, and to retrieve the test results. Um, now, something about future developments of the ETF. Uh, there are a lot. We are currently working to uh, create an automated pipeline for testing and integration of new uh, features of both the ETS and the ETF. There's a workflow here based on open source software, but I'll skip it. Uh, then we want to provide additional download formats for test reports. Uh, currently, as I said, it's only HTML, but we would like, for instance, also PDF to be available. Through the API, you can already get reports in JSON and in uh, XML, but we would like to uh, actually improve the web application. Uh, we want also to separate automatic from manual checks. For example, by providing manual checks as a separate list at the end of the test report, just to make it clear for the user what uh, he or she has to test manually. We want to improve also the way in which uh, users can filter the test reports and find their test report, because sometimes it's not really easy for them to find what they are looking for, so their test reports. And then we would like to um, change the UI or uh, create additional UIs of the validator to help those people who are less experts and don't know actually how to start the test or which conformance classes to, to, to choose. Also, uh, something that is under development is an improvement of test reports with graphics. The rationale behind this is that sometimes the way the results are presented uh, 
gives the visual impression that the outcome is negative, although perhaps there is just one or few tests that failed. So the idea is to add to the current test report some graphics like uh, this histogram or this performance bar to give a, a more immediate idea of the outcome. And also we will, by the end of the year, probably have a full restyle of the UI to, um, to be in line with the graphics of the uh, commission. All these improvements are discussed and agreed upon through a governance mechanism based on a steering group. Currently it is formed by uh, representatives of the two main sponsors of the ETF, which are the JRC and Interactive Instruments. Steering group uh, is complemented by a technical committee, which of course uh, provides technical feedback on the improvement proposals, reviews the pull requests, and so on. And we have developers. Clearly it's open source project, so any contribution is welcome. The contribution terms are regulated by the UPL uh, terms and the developer certificate of origin. Uh, this is just the workflow of each improvement proposal. So initially it's a draft, then it needs to be discussed by the steering group, analyzed by the technical committee, and then it once accepted, it goes through the release pipeline. Very important, the interaction with the community happens through uh, the so-called community space, which is nothing but another repository uh, in the same uh, uh, workspace. We decided to create this at the end of last year to have a single uh, place for anything related to the validator. So first of all, a place where we could um, publish changelog and release planning to inform about current and future developments, but also a single place for an help desk for users to report problems, propose new features of the validator, and open any kind of discussion. In particular, um, for the help desk, uh, once an issue is open, uh, we basically categorize it with a number of labels according to the status of the implementation of the solution. So we have like under analysis at the beginning, then while we are thinking to a solution, it's planned under development and then ready for testing. So when you see this label, means that a solution was developed and uh, is already uh, deployed in the staging instance. So we use a staging instance for testing. We inform the person who opened the issue to please test the solution and provide feedback. If the feedback is positive and there is no disagreement, we label the issue as solved and then we also, in, in a, at the second time, deploy it in production. We are also working to uh, finalize some contributors' guidelines for pull requests. Uh, this is for the ETS, of course, not the ETF. And probably next week you will have them. Um, final slide on the future work. Uh, most important thing is that the plan, uh, the plan is to use the validator to test metadata conformity within the 2020 monitoring and reporting. As I said, this is news because now the validator is not used for monitoring and reporting. The workflow is different. Uh, I've already mentioned the development plan for the ETF, so the, basically the, the software, the web application. In terms of ATS and ETS, we would like to complete the set of uh, conformance classes with the, um, those for Annex 2 and Annex 3 uh, data specifications, including uh, tests for coverage data sets. But interesting, we uh, probably will have some new conformance classes to test additional requirements coming from the Inspire uh, work program in particular uh, to validate Inspire data encoded in GeoJSON. This is coming from another action. Uh, Alex, my colleague, has uh, mentioned this in a presentation this morning. Um, and then also to test a new approach currently under testing uh, from some member states on uh, how to simplify the uh, data service linking. So basically the linkage between um, data sets metadata and service metadata. I close just to, uh, with saying that we will have a workshop for both users and developers of the validator first and second day of October. Uh, that's it, uh, sorry if I had to run, but it's quite a comprehensive overview. I'm happy to enter the details if you, if you need it. Thank you. This was very good, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> do we have any questions on the reference validator from the audience? I may I just ask if uh, uh, you are all familiar with Inspire, if you are data providers, if you are software developers, uh, if you are companies providing consultancy, just to, just to, to know who, what kind of public or we have. Okay. No. Yeah, uh, does anybody have a question? Do, are you using the validator? <laughs> can I make questions? <laughs> I, can, I can ask you one. Um, I've used the validator um, some years ago in my previous life. Um, uh, and it was really helpful because it helped you to tune your GML files to suit the uh, required format 
required form much better. Uh, but be because it's a web based, uh, it's a web page, right? And are you keeping any score of uh, how much uh, validation has been done? Uh, and who is doing it, and how much is failing, and how much is not failing? Yes, so I can say that the validator is increasingly used. Uh, we are keeping track, so we have analytics in place. Uh, actually, now we have just moved to the cloud, so we have kind of fragmented numbers, but the validator is increasingly used. As I said, the way test reports are presented now, basically, uh, almost always give the, the outcome failed, even if only one assertion of one test case or one conformance class is failed, which maybe means that it's 99% uh, passed, but it's failed according to the, to, the, uh, to the outcome. So if you look at the test reports page, you would notice a lot of red text, but this doesn't mean that, of course, uh, uh, there is no actually compliance. Uh, so I would say that the situation is slowly but uh, progressively improving. Uh, as also we could see, and uh, if you were this morning here for, uh, uh, in the other presentation for the GeoPortal um, content, the GeoPortal is the place where you can actually access uh, all uh, inspired data sets published by member states. The situation is improving, is progressing. So uh, it's a process, so we cannot expect uh, Inspire to be implemented from one day to the other, but uh, I would say that in terms of numbers and in terms of outcomes, the situation is really improving. Oh, there's a couple of questions now. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Just one question. Uh, uh, maybe I shall know it, but also for the for the single audience, uh, with the Inspire, there is an expectation that uh, providers and member states will fulfill also requirements for the performance of services, so-called quality of service uh, uh, criteria. Uh, was there already some request or discussion whether the validator shall somehow help uh, commission and also member states to start to monitor this traffic and this performance of services or this is still not on the table nowadays? Thanks. Thank Thanks for this question, Martin. This is uh, at the moment out of, uh, of discussion. So we are still at the point where we, the, where member states should test the, the, the compliance of their services, not, not yet the, the, the performance. But uh, uh, of course, uh, as I said, the, we are still uh, working on how on providing accessibility of data set through the GeoPortal and slowly also the compliance of data sets uh, through the validator and. Uh, uh, slowly we will come to the point where also the performance of services will, will be um, considered, of course, and okay. measured also. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, I've been testing some WMSs using a validator, but, and I have some failures, but I have no idea where the failure is at. Like, I can't understand the human readable part. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> is that something you improving still? Uh, what exactly did you test? You said WMS. Ah, WMS. Okay, WMS is one of the newest test suites that have been uh, implemented. Uh, of course, without having a look at the specific resource you tested, what I can just uh, suggest you is just to open an issue in the community space, so in the help desk, and this would be this will be addressed. There are a number of cases where actually the community is saying it's not clear enough. It's not. Uh, say the explanation is not sufficient uh, for me to understand where the problem is and how to fix the, the service in this case. So this, is, this can happen. I mean, it's typical. So my suggestion is let's have a look together if you want, but even better, just open a, an issue and this will be addressed and, and solved, of course. So another question here? A little question is, um, so we can know somehow which is the roadmap for solving the issues because uh, also when we are implementing the, um, when we are implementing these services, we are finding that there are some problems, but actually those problems are not in our data, but are in the validator. And uh, certain uh, issues were raised, but uh, even if they raised some one year or two years ago, still nothing happened and we don't know when they will be fixed. And the most important issue which we have currently, it's about the counterclockwise uh, order, because if we are doing uh, it correctly, then the validator is saying it's not correctly. If we are fixing it, then uh, it's the OGC site team engine which is saying no, it's not correct. So in any case, we are 
for us it's impossible to pass any test because it will not pass. Yeah, thanks for, for this question. Uh, we are aware of this long-standing issue about the validation of geometries, and you're right, at the moment uh, there is this problem, and it's a long-standing one. I can just say that this is uh, in the roadmap, and uh, we hope to fix it soon. The fact is that uh, we created October or November last year this single help desk, this single uh, community space, exactly to uh, put all the issues and all the requests in a single space, because before there was this request in another uh, GitHub uh, issue tracker, there were an email of, about the validator, so basically we had many places and we could not actually manage easily all the, all the requests uh, and, and the problems. So this is also one of the reasons why we now have one single help desk, one single mechanism and workflow to manage the issues. So we well, in this case, we know about this issue, and I uh, was discussing before with some developers of the validators here. So this is something that has been raised and is periodically raised by our community. So thanks for the reminder, and uh, be sure that this will be uh, addressed soon. Okay, and thank you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you for coming.